welcome to the final session. I'm Ippe Fujiwara, professor of economics here at ANU and the Keio University in Tokyo. Uh, we first acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respect to the elders past and the present. This session, so that's going to start the, the final session. So this session will discuss uh, governance challenges. Very exciting topic. And uh, we are fortunate to have uh, three distinguished speakers in this panel. The first speaker is Keiichiro Kobayashi, professor at the Keio University, and is also the member of the subcommittee on novel coronavirus disease control of the Japanese government. This morning, he just participated in this meeting, so we should be able to know the, what is the forefront in Japanese government actions to COVID-19. The second speaker is Motoko Rich. Motoko is a Tokyo Bureau Chief for the New York Times. Motoko is a graduate of Yale as well as Cambridge University. And Motoko has been a reporter with the New York Times since 2003 and has covered a broad range of topics such as Japanese politics, society, economy, education, gender, the arts, and many more. And the final speaker is Shiro Armstrong. To the participants to this Japan update, I believe no introduction is needed to Shiro. Shiro is the engine of this Japan update and is the leading scholar of the economic and the political issues in Japan and the region and the Asia. As the director of the Austrian Japan Research Center, uh, Shiro has been contributing to the better understanding of Japan in Australia. So without a further ado, I would like to hand over to Keiichiro. So could you start your presentation, Keiichiro? Are you ready? Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to this very precious opportunity. I will share my uh, presentation slides now. So I would just talk about some some problem between government agencies as a, and uh, okay so the government issues on policy response in response to the uh, COVID nineteen. So there are what I want to talk here today is there are, there were lots of uh, coordination failures among the government agency in the last one year and a half in, in the in the in response to the COVID nineteen and. Uh, so, so actually, uh, uh, before the, this crisis, government agencies in Japan are quite independent with each other, and there are uh, problems of coordinations in the Jap Japanese government. And uh, so, so typically, uh, they are have the, the, each agencies have uh, some kind of compartmentalized thinking. I, and I, I mean, they care only about their own backyard, and they don't care about others. And so. The, the 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 each government agency are very good at local um, local optimization of the objectives, uh, but, but they are very bad in a uh, they're not very good at the global optimization when the coordination is necessary, uh, just like uh, as just as in this uh, COVID nineteen crisis. So I talk uh, I talk three examples. Here, and that, that was the first one is a fallacy of composition of fiscal uh, policy in COVID-19 um, policy measures, and uh, uh, secondly, we I talk about the, the loose or delayed border control in this crisis, and also I finally I talk about uh, Jap why Japanese. Uh, government cannot implement many uh, cases of PCR testing in COVID-19 crisis. The, the, the number of cases of COVID, uh, PCR testing in Japan was very small, extremely small compared to other nations uh, uh, like the UK or United States. So I talk the, these issues here. Okay, so first of all, the, uh, I think th there is a big fallacy of composition on, in, on the fiscal policy in, in, in the policy, policy measures in Japan. The, 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 the start line is that 
the the bottom line that the Ministry of Finance in Japan always wants to improve government fiscal balance because Japan has already uh, suffered from huge amount of government debt, which is uh, nearly 240 percent of GDP before the COVID-19 crisis. And after this crisis, I mean, in the end of 2020, uh, the, the public debt surged to the 260% of GDP now. So it's a huge amount. And so the Minister of Finance wants to improve the government budget, so they want to cut any expenditures on COVID-19. So especially if they want to, uh, you know, cut expenditures on payment to restaurants, which is uh, some kind of compensation of closure of the, the, the restaurants in Japan. But the uh, Minister of Health were, wanted to, to continue uh, shut down policy on restaurants. So they want, to they want the, the Japanese restaurants to close uh, at eight o'clock in the evening. So, but they they have to compensate the the the, the, the profit. So they have so the government have to pay had to pay some some uh, some amount of the compensation to the restaurant. But anyway, so the the Minister of Health wanted to continue sufficient the the shutdown policy sufficiently longer to reduce infection. It is reasonable, but but given the Minister of Finance intentions that they don't pay any more. The Minister of Health cannot offer any more payment to the to the restaurant. So, so this uh, given this no pay no more payment, the restaurants in Japan resisted to obey the shutdown policy in Japan. And uh, politically, uh, the the Minister of Health has to uh, end prematurely the this shutdown policy. So, so then infection increases again after the, the lifting of the shutdown policy. And then the infection increases again very rapidly and the government is forced to impose shutdown policy again. So th this is a cycle, in a sense, cycle of the uh, policy measures in COVID-19 crisis repeated in uh, uh, several, uh, uh, several months cycles. So the, uh, then the, finally, the consequence is that the economic cost increases and that impairs government fiscal bar. Fiscal bar. So the intention, the first intention of the uh, Ministry of Finance was that uh, in, to, they want to improve the government fiscal balance, but the consequence is that uh, we have a more worse uh, government fiscal balance the, the, and also continued uh, infections in, in Japan. So, so that's uh, what we experienced in the last uh, last year. And th this problem is, uh, is not solved yet. And so government is still uh, very reluctant to pay more pay to the restaurants and the re restaurants never now restaurant, many restaurants uh, just uh, ignore the, the government uh, requirement to, to shut down the, 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 the restaurants. That's one problem here. And the, we also suffer from the loose border control. For example, we, the, the, the announcement of Boris Johnson uh, that in UK, they found a very dangerous alpha variant. Uh, the, the announcement was December 14 in the last year. But uh, uh, since then, the Japan uh, uh, strengthened the, the border control and shut down the entry of all foreigners from the world. But it's on the January 14 this year. So it takes very long time. I mean, it takes one, hour, one, one month to, to shut down the border, uh, even though we know that uh, we have a, a, the, 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 the existed the alpha variant in, in UK. So the ministry, this is a kind of coordinate, some kind of coordination failure between Ministry of Health and uh, uh, 
public health experts, the Ministry of Health resisted to shut down the border early because they, need, they say they needed the scientific advice from public health experts. On the other hand, the public health experts did not, can, could not give uh, advice timely uh, because they needed time and data to analyze a new variant because it's an experienced one. So, so it's a, so because of this kind of uh, coordination failure, so the, the, the politicians do nothing. And so they just extend, uh, they just continue to, to open the, the border for, to, to the, to the, to the uh, foreigners for the nearly one month. And they finally shut down. January 14th. So that's a, a one experience. And also we uh, repeated the same kind of experience in, in the for the Delta variant, which is found in India in late April in, in this year. So Japan, Japanese government started to isolate uh, uh, the isolation of the entrant of 10, 10 days. Uh, I mean, the entrance of Japanese and Japan residents from India. So, so the isolation of 10 days has just started on May 28 this year. So, so it takes uh, about one, one month to, to, have a, have a, to, to implement this stringent border control. And the Ministry of Health resisted to make a stringent isolation because they, they say that they do not have sufficient human resources to, to, to con manage uh, this, uh, the many, many entrants uh, from India. So, so because they, they don't have uh, sufficient staff, they want to release the entrants to, to, the, to the domestic uh, society. So, so it's a kind of, uh, uh, some, 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 I think it's it's a very uh, inefficient decision making in Japan. So, so finally, so, sorry, I think it's time. Sorry, but finally, the, I, I talk about uh, extremely small number of cases in PCR testing in Japan. So, uh, as you know, uh, the COVID nineteen has uh, many uh, asymptomatic patients. So, we have uh, info incomplete information in in the market that. Uh, we, we don't know who are infected in the economy. So it's a, this kind of uncertainty and the information uh, incompleteness uh, make a shrinkage of economic activity. It's a very serious problem in, econ in economic policy. So if we consider the PCR testing as economic policy, it has a very uh, effective to rectify the incomplete information and revitalize the economy. So, 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 in this view, from the econo uh, from economic point of view, the test negative result is a very useful result because we know that you are not infected. So it's a, it's a rectified the incomplete information and revitalized economy. So we, so so economists in Japan uh, argue that we should implement T PCR testing on everyone or as as many as possible. So this is a view of the business community and the economists in Japan. But the views of public health experts are very different from this. They say that the purpose of PCR testing is to find the, the infected patients and uh, isolate them and cure them efficiently. So implementing PCR tests on many asymptomatic citizens and getting many test negative results is very inefficient use of uh, test resources. So th this is a, their argument. So public health experts strictly resist to increase the capacity of PCR testing in Japan. And uh, they think it's not efficient use of test, test, uh, capacity, test capacity, so uh, test, test resources. So they want to, restrict the number of capacity and number of uh, implementation of tests in Japan. 
So they, they, in a sense, they never accept the idea that uh, PCR testing is useful as a economic policy, and they insist that it should be used to, to for only for the medical purposes. So, so it's a kind of uh, coordination failure between medical community and uh, economic policy community. So, so I think it's a very serious problem. It's a very serious problem in Japan. So, sorry for. for I used too, too much time. Okay. Thank you so much for the fantastic presentation, Keiichiro. So you identified in a clear manner about the, the obstacles which prevent the swift policy decision making. Thank you so much. And I would like to have some, you know, have a question and answers. I would like some some questions on this issue later. And uh, so next we're gonna have a. Motoko as a presenter. So, and uh, you know, so many things happened recently Olympic Games and the Paralympics, and uh, you know, the election for the prime minister this month. And uh, we're going to have a general election next month. So, there's so many things. I don't know whether 10 minutes or 15 minutes is enough for you, but uh, I would like to hear your views on this. Please go. Ahead, thank you Motoko. so much. And also, uh, thank you so much, Keijiro, for a really interesting um, topic. Uh, just quickly, I want to mention that I'm obviously no public health or economic expert, but based on what you say, what's so fascinating, having just covered the Olympics and also been sort of a participant in their testing regime, the philosophy of the Tokyo Organizing Committee was to test rigorously. Every athlete that participated in the Olympics and Paralympics was tested every single day. And the sort of negative test was part of their policy in order to assure the safety of the whole community. So it's very interesting, this point that you're making. I think the, the Tokyo organizers and, and the uh, IOC and the IPC actually recognize the wisdom of what you're saying of using PCR testing as a, as a policy instrument to help ensure, uh, you know, in their case, the ongoing um, sustainability of the games, but also the, the health of all those who are participating. But um, uh, thank you so much to Australian National University. Uh, the Crawford School of Public Policy and Shiro and Ipe and Lauren Richardson all for inviting me to this distinguished panel. Um, it's really an honor to be here and I'm always glad to speak to people who are interested in Japan and its place in the world. And I think that what's so interesting about Japan is it's not just a place that people who are specifically and explicitly interested in Japan can learn more by talking about it together, but there are so many challenges that Japan faces that are not unique to Japan and that other countries around the world could learn from by learning more about the challenges and the solutions that the Japan is trying to propose. But in the current moment, um, so last Friday, it was the, almost the end of the Paralympics in Tokyo, and I was just about to jump on a train. I was going to go see bocce. And the reason why I wanted to go see this sport is I had previously talked to the head of the Japan Bocce Foundation, and she had talked about how an inclusive sport this was. She said people of all ages and abilities can play together. And it sort of seemed like a fascinating model for how different groups in Japanese society could work together and take better better advantage of the diversity that already exists in Japan. Um, so I'd, I'd already been to watch badminton, which is one of the few sports where mixed teams of men and women play together. And I'd watched a match between a wheelchair match between a 23 year old player and a 53 year old. So this was a huge age gap between these two players who are competitive with each other. Although the younger player, by the way, won and went on to win a gold medal for Japan. Um, but my Paralympic plans on last Friday came to a screeching halt because as I was about to leave my apartment to get on the train, of course, this alert popped up on my phone saying the Prime Minister Suga has decided not to stand for re-election as leader of the party. So got to cancel those Olymp Paralympic plans. And I spent the afternoon scrabbling to interview political scientists and write a story about why suga son was going to be one of Japan's infamous one-year prime ministers. Um, and I don't want to get too metaphorical here, but it sort of felt like I was about to see this possible model for a different kind of future for Japan. And I was dragged back into business as usual Japan, the one where factional politics and a bunch of mostly men in back rooms get to decide what happens in the country. Uh, and to some extent, it's very likely that that's what's going to happen this time around. Most political analysts believe it's basically a foregone conclusion that whoever wins the leadership election for the head of the Liberal Democratic Party at the end of this month will become the prime minister of Japan, and that when we have a general election either next month or November, it's not going to change that outcome. 
Yet I think we may also see some hints of a slow transition towards a different Japanese future, even in what is happening now. So in this crazy week that preceded Suga-san's decision, he first said he would stand for re-election, and was re uh, he was sort of trying to desperately hold on to his position. He said he would reshuffle the cabinet, appoint a new secretary general of the party. But the reason he was doing this in the first place was he was trying to quell a minor rebellion among the younger generation in his party. They didn't want to run in a general election with Suga as the head of the ticket. So it was the younger generation that was driving his actions. So maybe we're seeing the beginning of a moment of generational transition. We don't know yet whether the younger generation, particularly in the LDP, will represent a change in direction for the party in terms of actual policies. But we've seen some glimpses, right? So Shinjiro Koizumi, who's the currently the youngest member of the current cabinet, took paternity leave when his wife gave birth to their first child. It was, you know, a very tiny, short leave, but it was something, and his father certainly never did that. So it appears also that the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, perhaps he's still trying to burnish his womanomics credentials, is backing Sanae Takaichi as leader of the party. And if she were to win, uh, she would become the first woman prime minister of Japan. I think there are some feminists um, who might feel ambivalent about that milestone, given that Takeichi san has some fairly right-wing views that aren't entirely supportive of women's rights, but her leadership itself would never nevertheless represent a historic moment in Japanese political leadership. And Japanese politicians often surprise you. So for example, Tomomi Inada, who was also backed by Prime Minister Abe when she served as his defense minister and is known as a far-right conservative on many issues, uh, earlier this year, she backed a much more progressive cause when she tried to introduce an LGBTQ anti-discrimination law uh, in the diet. Uh, unfortunately, some of her other right-wing colleagues didn't allow the bill to come for consideration on the floor of the diet, but the fact that she was the one that was kind of ardently supporting it was, was surprising and very interesting, I thought. There are many voices in Japanese society that are still fighting to be heard, and the powerful structure that favors long-standing elites can make it very difficult for those voices to break out and be heard. But again, there have been recent signs that the old guard is at least on notice. So when Yoshino Mori, a former prime minister and the president of the Tokyo Organizing Olympic, uh, sorry, a Tokyo Olympic Organizing Committee made sexist comments about women saying they talked too much in meetings, I think in another era, maybe just a few years ago, even he would have survived after making a public apology. But a group of young women organized a petition that got a lot of traction on social media, and he ultimately had to resign. And Seiko Hashimoto, a woman, took over his position. And more young people that I talk to seem to be breaking out of the traditional college to retirement track of joining one company and staying for their entire career. I've talked to a lot of mixed race Japanese who are looking to develop environmentally sustainable projects. So there's change in the younger generation. On the flip side, the younger generation is the least likely to vote. One of the reasons that the LDP has remained in power for all but four years since 1955 is that people just don't vote in Japan anymore. I recently read a pretty arresting statistic. So Shinzo Abe won a landslide victory, or the LDP under Shinzo Abe's leadership won a landslide victory in 2012 with fewer votes than when the party lost in 2009 to the Democratic Party of Japan. So if more people wake up and decide to vote, politics might change in Japan. Japan is such a wonderful country in so many ways, but it faces a lot of challenge that its current political leadership does not seem to be reckoning with in a serious way. There's a demographic overhang that will only become more pronounced as the population ages, significant entrenched sexism that holds back women, looming environmental and energy catastrophe. There's a lot of talk about the importance of dealing with these problems, but few few bold policy prescriptions. It seems like Japan needs more than the men in the back rooms to help make the kinds of changes it will need to survive and thrive in the future. And I welcome the chance to have a really engaged Q&A with all of you. So I hope you'll ask lots of good questions. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you so much for Motoko-san so that you can see my, my gesture. So I was so, it was so fant fantastic presentation and you covered uh, so many topics and uh, that's definitely ignited lots of discussion. And uh, thank you very much for identifying the problems at the same time that, you know, showing the, some signs of the tradi tradition uh, that, that, uh, tra transition. So that 
so we're going to discuss lots of things in a Q&A session. So the last but not least, uh, we're going to have a presentation by Shiro. So that you're going to talk about the, maybe the security issue, but also you can comment on the previous two presentations. So Shiro, please go ahead. Thanks so much, Ute, and, and thanks for that really kind introduction before. Um, look, <clears throat> when we talk about governance, we've heard a bit about how Japan's responded to COVID and the, the politics now, and a bit more than the politics, transformation of Japan. I want to focus on Japan's new economic security policies, or as the Japanese government's calling it, an economic security strategy. Um, we foreshadowed this a bit in the previous panel, but you know, this is really a response to US-China strategic competition and really a, a more uncertain external environment. So since 2019, Japan's been implementing these new economic security policies uh, and making changes to the machinery of government, and, and I'll come back to that. To that. Um, why I think it's worth focusing on this is it really affects Japan's international economic posture and the competitiveness of the Japanese economy. So we're really talking about um, how Japan interacts internationally, economically, but also its uh, productivity at home and its, its welfare. This idea goes well beyond ideas of energy security and food security of the past and rulemaking and strengthening the global rules-based um, open economic system. Now, Japan, I think, has got a very good track record there recently, especially of leadership in concluding the Trans-Pacific Partnership without the United States. Uh, and with being the president of the G20 and hosting a successful Osaka summit. Um, but on these new policies since 2019, this is where Japan has really led the way, I think, uh, internationally with proactive changes um, to policy, but also bureaucratic machinery. Uh, and there's a real attempt to break down bureaucratic silos across um, you know, decision makers and, and um, policies, silos across economics, foreign policy and security, and to add some coordination um, within and across ministries. So in 2019, METI, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, set up an economic security division. Uh, and then in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we had an economic security policy division. Um, uh, and then it's undergone a couple of changes, um, but that's in the Foreign Policy Bureau now. And then, of course, in the National Security Secretariat in the Prime Minister's office uh, in 2020, they set up an economic division or an economic security division. So these uh, are attempts to bring together economic and national security considerations. The key question here is whether they uh, lead to integration of economic and security interests or whether one is being subsumed by the other. In the case of um, the National Security Secretary, perhaps economic policy being subsumed by security policy. So why is Japan doing this? Well, it's really to try to find a middle ground and to avoid that extreme of decoupling, of technological or economic decoupling um, within the US-China uh, strategic competition. So it is proactive by Japan, but it's really uh, in response to US tightening export controls of advanced technology. And that started in 2018 under the Trump administration. Um, and as part of the broader decoupling uh, between the United States and China. This, of course, brought back memories in Japan of being caught in the crossfire uh, between the United States and Soviet Union, with Toshiba um, being caught and you know, a bit of memories of being fined significantly um, in the 80s. So the policy is to protect non-allied acquisition of advanced technology. And these are really, and I'll talk a bit about these, restrictions on foreign investment, um, export controls and scrutiny of collaboration with research um, that involved Chinese links. So even the Ministry of Education has included um, an economic security division. And this is an area of active policy development. So there are new laws being prepared, um, strategies uh, that really work on supply chain resilience, um, a digital strategy that promotes democratic values and semiconductor cooperation with allies. Um, and they've identified a number of sectors. Um, so this is all very positive and proactive and forward looking, but this is an extremely complicated and difficult area. And I just wanna focus on three episodes that, that demonstrate the difficulty of these policies and also uh, some early policy stumbles. The first is a restriction on foreign investment. So Japan has made foreign investment more restrictive coming into Japan. Um, and this is, I think, a problem for Japanese competitiveness. Um, Japan's already very closed to foreign competition. 
um, and further restrictions, including making the threshold for foreign investment count from 10% equity stake to 1%. Um, you know, it goes, flies in the face of policy goals to improve um, Japan's competitiveness in attracting foreign investment. Uh, and this is a problem because Japan is dead last in the world um, in terms of how much foreign investment there is in the Japanese economy. So that's you know, a stock of foreign direct investment relative to GDP. Um, a common measure for this, and Japan has 4.3%. Uh, world average is 42%. China has 20%, for example. And Japan has less foreign investment in its economy um, relative to the size of its economy than North Korea. So that should tell you something about how closed Japan is to foreign investment. Uh, the second issue is on supply chain resilience. This is where, uh, in response to worries about um, disruptions in supply chains, especially early on in the pandemic, uh, the Japanese government deployed subsidies to try to uh, reduce exposure to the Chinese market. Now, they weren't called, they didn't have China in the name. Uh, the press often reported them as China exit subsidies. Uh, there were $2 billion, US billion dollars worth of subsidies to onshore Japanese manufacturing and Japanese companies, and $200 million to expand manufacturing in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Of course, if you offer subsidies like this to companies, um, they're gonna take them up. Uh, and I think this was um, uh, probably at worst, um, no, sorry, at best, just a waste of money in corporate welfare. So they probably did distort some decision-making. So. Um, we had Japanese companies returning from the United States to Japan and from China to Japan, but from elsewhere as well. Now, this concentrates risk in Japan, you know, another flood or an earthquake, for example. Uh, but also, there was already a trend of companies moving from China to Southeast Asia and South Asia in search of lower cost manufacturing. So companies were already moving and um, would, of course, take up um, uh, these subsidies. So. Uh, uh, this $2 billion of subsidies um, really flew in the face of Chinese, uh, sorry, Japanese investment going into China, which last year was $11.3 so almost six times the amount of the subsidies. Uh, and of course, first quarter of this year has continued to grow. So $2.5 billion of Japanese investment is still continuing to flow into to China. So um, the LDP policy heavyweight, um, Mr. Amari, has talked about supply chain resilience in terms of strategic autonomy and strategic indispensability. Um, this, to me, um, not really clear what this means, but it looks like uh, more MITI, old school MITI protectionist um, um, industrial policy than, than anything um, modern and new that's going to protect from these concerns of being stuck between the United States and, and China. I'll, I'll end here with um, probably the biggest policy stumble, I, I would say, and that's with the trade war with South Korea. Uh, so right after the Osaka G20 summit, um, Japan was championing a rules-based order, of course, successfully concluded that summit, um, but took South Korea off the whitelist for exports of critical technologies, three critical technologies. Um, that's, of course, caught up in the broader political spat between Japan and South Korea and the Korean Supreme Court decision um, on reparations for comfort women. So um, three key technologies. Um, uh, the Japanese government intervened in the export of these to South Korea. These are important for semiconductor um, production, memory chips, um, OLED displays, and things where South Korea really dominated downstream industries. Um, Japan's a major exporter of these, and South Korea is a major importer. The technical justification was, of course, you don't want these critical technologies to end up in North Korea or the Chinese military. Um, but the reality was, of course, these were heavily politicized. Um, the problem here was that Japanese restrictions shook confidence in Japan as a reliable supplier. Um, Japanese companies moved to some to South Korea to supply these, um, these technologies to South Korean uh, firms but also Japanese firms supplied these from Belgium and elsewhere. Um, Korean government subsidized heavily um, the development of this industry in, in South Korea. Um, and the share of Japanese exports of these three, especially one key technology, um, uh, one chemical fell drastically. So there are active policies now in South Korea to substitute inputs. Uh, and they think of this as trying to achieve supply chain resilience from Japan. So 
um, in the name of economic security uh, in this really difficult, new, uncertain external environment, Japan has deployed some policies that I think um, are more in the name of national security, and some have been politicised heavily, uh, that I don't think we quite have the balance right on these in these cases between economic interests and competitiveness and the national security interests. So I'll leave it there and look forward to questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for for very insightful, for offering your insightful views on the foreign policy in Japan. And I also thank three panelists for very, uh, very detailed and uh, insightful, you know, discussions on the Japanese, Japan at, at the moment. So that, uh, maybe the three, three panelists, could you turn, turn on your video? Okay, so we already have a uh, lots of nice questions, but uh, do you have any questions each other so that you know if you have any question and uh, I would like to have some discussion among three is there anyone who'd like to go first well I'd love to ask Kobayashi-san um, about the Please. sort of fundamental um, clash over all of the COVID management has been sort of between the economy and the um, the epidemiological community. And at least it seems from observing and talking to folks that the political um, will has sort of leaned toward the economic side, sometimes to the detriment of the, the science side. But do you think that's a fair evaluation? I mean, I think most citizens that I talk to and, and analysts think that the government, you know, ma made many decisions like with the go-to campaign and inviting oh, the Olympics, yeah. that they seem to be favoring the economy rather than public health. But do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I think in a sense it's, uh, uh, poli politically, uh, they, they prefer to, to, to respond to the economic needs. But uh, I think, they want to relax the restrictions so any any time so so they want to go to the start the uh, go to campaign and they want to go to start the olympic games but uh, i think the, the judgment of the government may not be uh, helpful for the for the uh, to to increase the welfare of the economic welfare of the japanese society because because government prematurely Relax the restrictions. The, the, the consequence was that uh, we ha we repeated, we we are forced to repeat repeat the, the the state of emergency many times, right? So it is harmful for the for the economy as a so, so as a whole. So the judgment of government is in a sense too short sighted. Uh, even though they, they their intention was to 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 increase of economic welfare, but their action uh, reduces, re reduced the economic welfare of the Japanese people. So that's my assessment. So, so the intention is good, but their action was bad. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a, my, uh, my answer. Yeah. yeah, that makes total sense. Thank you. Yeah. A any other question each other or fighting each other or no? I think we have a lot of great questions in the Q&A. Yeah, that's right. That's so, so let's go to that. So that I already have several questions. So that two, two, two participants asked that uh, the one that, uh, you know, Koizumi or Abe administration, you know, may, um, I, I think, uh, moved towards the more like a top-down decision making. But uh, Keiichiro mentioned uh, lots about, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of the coordination failures. So that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that uh, you know that maybe that they they yeah. changed or still there were not so much so many changes in the Japanese policy decision making? Yeah, as a former Japanese government bureaucrat, uh, I can say something about this history. So, so Koizumi government, the Abe government, in early two thousand, the, they have a, they implemented a re reform, political reform. And I think it makes some improvement in the economic policy, but uh, public health, public health policy or, or medical policy is uh, some kind of di dinosaur in Japanese government. So they never changed after the uh, you know, World War II. 
and uh, they, they, their action, their, you know, pr procedure of their policy making is very uh, closed. And uh, in the Ministry of Health and Labor and Welfare, there are so-called so experts. I mean, uh, Ike Gikan, which is a medical, medical technicians in the Ministry of Health and uh, Labor and Welfare, they they have a uh, medical they have a medical doctor uh, degree and uh, they are very they form a very close community and they they decide everything about medical policy in Japan and the the the, the government I mean economists and some other uh, experts in in other field cannot intervene to the decision by the medical experts. That was what we continued for the last 50 or 60 years. And so then we have a COVID-19 pandemic crisis now, and the medical policy was in the forefront of the policy issues of the Japanese government. But uh, the system is very old fashioned as a dinosaur. So they, so, so the, the, the decision making is very, uh, in a sense, weird from the, our point of view. So we, tr we try, I mean, economists try to, 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 to communicate them very well and improve their decision making, but, uh, uh, st we are now still struggling to, to, to how to communicate with these public health experts. Of course, they are rational. I think their policy making is rational in, in their own field. You know, they, they, they are very, they make a very uh, rational policy making. If they, we consider, uh, if, if we fo focus on the med medical field, but they don't care about the huge cost of economic community or some out, outside the community. So that's, that, that's a problem in Japan. So, Thank yeah. you very much. And uh, also, Motoko, you mentioned the signs of the transition. So do you, do you, can, can you share your views to, with us? Well, I mean, I think the signs of transition that I mentioned were more, um, you know, very small buds at the beginning, not necessarily addressing some of these very big problems that Kobayashi-san um, uh, has very ably explained. And I think anyone who's worked in Japan has experienced this sort of, I mean, isn't there a word, tatewari gyose, the, the sort of siloed administration. I mean, even if you try to file some paperwork in Japan, you're probably familiar with how you have to go to three different departments. And if you go to the wrong department, you know, nobody feels, nobody has agency to sort of think creatively and collaboratively. And, and, and in this case, you know, it has been a real problem because, you know, the sort of idea of expertise is so siloed and narrow. And so as Kobayashi-san is saying, this sort of narrow definition of who is a medical expert and who is allowed to have an opinion or bring their expertise to the decision um, has been very difficult and sort of puzzling to watch because in some ways we now have a lot of evidence about what works. And one of the things that we do have evidence about is that testing is a fairly, I mean, in Japan, like I was saying at the beginning of my talk about what happened during the Olympics, it, it, it is puzzling to me that a, a Japanese agency could not now say that there is evidence. They don't have to wait for evidence. They're, it's already available. There were very few, you know, relatively few cases in the Olympic bubble. And part of that presumably has to do with the sort of rigorous testing and the requirement for rigorous testing, both, you know, coming to Japan, everybody had to take two tests within 96 hours of landing. And then they were tested every day after they landed. Um, sure, the, the idea that there isn't this ability to look outward, I don't see enough signs of that part, sort of that big picture changing. I, I also saw a question in the Q&A about whether the result in the Yokohama election suggests that mm -hmm. there might be more mobilization of voters, which is an issue that I talked about. It's an excellent question, and I think perhaps that's what the opposition is hoping for. We've seen a lot of these signs, though, that it, it appears a lot of times that voters use these local elections to punish the LDP, but not actually to presage a change. So, for example, Abe suffered terrible losses in um, uh, uh, Tokyo local 
local election um, and then went on three or four months later to win, you know, so-called landslide in a national election, again, because of low voter turnout. But it was clear that the people turned out in the local Tokyo election and gave the LDP a drubbing to sort of teach him a lesson. But then when it came to the national elections, it didn't sort of, there was no follow through. So I'm not sure I see that transition yet. Can, can I just Shiro, do you want to add? Do you want to add? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah. It, it's been a really helpful presentation to understand why the response has been what it has been because I've been quite, you know, surprised really um, with the structure of decision making having changed, as a questioner mentioned, and you know, centralization of decision making really in the Kante and, and Kobayashi-san, you mentioned that's mainly around economics, but surely that's where someone, especially like Suga, who was in charge as the chief cabinet secretary, um, would be able to balance some of those, you know, different views and different opinions from the business sector, from the economic ministry, from the health ministry, and in, in fact, call on other experts within um, Japan in that kind of structure where it's, you don't have to rely on one ministry so much. So, I mean, that that is pretty surprising to me. And I guess a question going forward then is, um, you know, we do have, uh, perhaps it's gone too far with the centralization of this decision making in the Kante and you know, top 600 bureaucrats being able to be um, fired quite easily by the chief cabinet secretary. Are we likely to see a reversal back? Maybe the pendulum has swung too far away from the bureaucracy towards elected politicians. You know, is there likely to be a bit of a, a correction back towards the bureaucracy in some way? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. So, the, yeah, so we would like to go on to the next question. So, Motoko san kindly already answered about uh, Yokohama, you know, the, the voting turn, turnout kind of thing. And a related topic is the, still the, you know, voter turnout for the younger is really low. And uh, why? And uh, also, related the question is that it's, it's a bit that related the question is the sociologically are uh, young Japanese still reluctant to marry so the what is the kind of the law activities among the young generations so that and uh, what the policy can do to 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 activate you know uh, activate them more or something if you could uh, share your your view that would be fantastic so uh, I did do a story about the youth vote because I was so puzzled about it, as it just turns out that when I first arrived in Japan, they lowered the voting age. And so I had assumed that there would be this huge turnout among these newly enfranchised groups. And in fact, there was not. Um, and in talking to people, I think there is this sort of sense of resignation. They just don't think that their vote matters all that much or that they can change that much or that even if they vote for another party, there will be that much change. I mean, certainly when I arrived in 2016, the wounds of 2011 were still very raw. And so the narrative I often heard from analysts and, and from some voters was, you know, we gave the opposition a chance and they messed it up. And so we don't want to trust them again. As we get further away, I mean, we've now commemorated the 10th anniversary of the 311 disaster. I mean, certainly from a Western perspective where we kind of have this kind of throw the bums out um, voting activity, you know, changing between parties happens in a lot of places. Um, it's sort of curious why it doesn't happen here. But I think there is this sense that the vote doesn't matter. I think on top of that, there is this sense that everybody who's running the country is super old and is not listening to the young people. So I think their feeling is, why should we show up to vote? It's not like they're listening to us. It's not like they're like us. They don't represent us. So I think there's a lot of that feeling. There's a disconnect often between public polls on certain kind of, you know, touchstone or hot button issues where it appears that the public thinks exactly the opposite of mainstream LGB policy, but the LGP does nothing to change it. Um, and so I think a lot of voters think, why should I vote? Because they're not listening to me. They don't care. They do what they want. I think on the question about whether um, young people are showing a disinclination to marry, yes, definitely. And it's gotten a lot worse during the pandemic. We don't know if that's more of a temporary um, phenomenon because people were, you know, struggling with work. If they had contract jobs, they may have lost them. If like the point that, that Kobayashi Sensei has been making about the subsidy, if you worked at a restaurant and your boss is not getting a subsidy, then you're not getting paid or you're getting paid less. 
you're not in the mood to sort of marry and family marriage is considered kind of the start of family formation. Why would you take on more responsibility when you don't even have enough income to cover yourself? So I think there is a lot of disinclination to marry, but I think it's complicated. I mean, I think from the woman's side, it's seeing what a traditional marriage means in Japan still does, despite some change and more active um, involvement by men. There's still been a lot of feeling that the women do everything and, and they don't really want to get married and start families when they also want to have fulfilling careers. They don't see how they can possibly balance it. From the men's side, it's, oh my gosh, I have to be able to support a traditional family structure where my wife can quit her job and stay home with the kids, but I don't have a job that makes enough money to support that. So I think there are a lot of complicated factors that play into that. Thank you so much for answering the two rather independent question nicely. But uh, I would like to know, so that it's true that, uh, you know, maybe young people's voting doesn't matter too much, but uh, then I, if this, this situation continues, you know, the policies tend to be not so good for them so that some change must happen in the future you know, or if this continues this way or so that Shiro or Keishiro do you have any 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 thoughts on this issue or will are we going to see some changes in the voting behavior for the younger people or never I better let Kobayashi-san answer that <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a very difficult question, and uh, pr pro problem is that you know, elderly population, elderly people care about their grandchildren and young people. So if the LDP and politicians want to you know do something good for the elderly people, they have to do some something good for the, their grandchildren. I, I think so. That's kind of uh, you know communication from from elderly voters to the politicians may change policy regime from from to, to, to from 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 uh, elderly oriented to the younger people oriented ones then maybe younger people will, will change their voting behavior but i i don't know it's a it's a kind of problem some miscommunication between politicians and uh, and voters I, so we need to, I think politicians need to recognize that the elderly voters want them to, to do something good for, for their younger uh, children and grandchildren. So that's a point, but I don't know how, how to, to, to correct the, this kind of misunderstanding between politicians and voters i don't know what's the answer but uh, okay uh, thank you very much. so maybe it's not the director to the younger generation but the, through older generation indirectly affecting the younger generation maybe the something to be taken and as a as a as a good measure to be taken in your future and uh okay i have uh, so many questions but okay so, um but i would like to have a view from three so that somebody asked about the uh, communication policy by the government, especially by the, the Prime Minister Suga on the COVID. But uh, so then I, I would like to know the, you know, you know, whether there's any, any way to improve the communication of, of, the, of the policy by the Japanese government or Keichiro, if you share your views on, uh, you know, how much we would have gained by better communication policy or something like that. So that Keichiro, could you start or maybe that you are, you are, I'm asking you too much so that maybe that we can start the reverse order. So maybe that this time is Shiro, could you, could you start about the, to discussing about the communication policy by the Japanese government? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll try. I'm more interested in hearing what Kobayashi-san and, and Motoko have to say about this, but this is not an easy issue for any government through this, this period, I think. And, um, you know, I think we've heard a bit about vaccine hesitancy and, and, and all of that in Japan. Um, I think when it comes to the crunch, the communication on, on that hasn't been too bad in Japan and the vaccine um, rollout has accelerated. Um, you know, I think it, it's talk about going through a difficult stretch anyway, but then having to host the Olympics. Um, and having a bit more clearer communication um, in, in one aspect I was watching would have helped. And that's 
there was a tendency to blame the Olympians or the people coming into the country for spreading the virus. But you know, this, this new wave was not, of course, brought in by Olympians. It was just um, the loosening of restrictions, really, or the, the fatigue of, of the, the soft lockdowns and the Delta variant going, going, you know, unleashing. So, you know, we did see a lot in the press, in the public domain of blaming you know, foreigners, unfortunately, during this, this new wave. And that's a kind of area where I think a bit more communication of, um, you know, from the government would have been pretty helpful. Sorry, P, you're on Sorry thank you so much, Shiro. So, um, Motoko-san, could, could you go next? So, your view about uh, I mean, I, communication. I actually, th sure. I mean, I, it's hard to imagine how communication could have been worse, to be honest, under the Suga administration. Um, uh, yes, this has been a challenge for every government around the world, and every government has had to deal with different communication challenges. But I, I, I think... To be honest, Suga-san was uniquely bad at communication on everything, but especially about this most important issue that was really affecting people's daily lives. I think there are a lot of people who just don't trust the government anymore. They don't believe anything they're being told. They were very untransparent. I mean, I was very closely following all the developments with regard to the Olympics, and there was you know, a lot of kind of coyness about the decisions that they were making and when they were making their decisions. They should have been much more straightforward and trusted the Japanese public. I mean, I think one of the great things about the Japanese public is, uh, you know, you see it every time there's a massive earthquake, the kind of rollout of communication from NHK and sort of the coordination and the ability of people to kind of pull together and, to, and react in a certain kind of way, you would have thought in a way, like I was sort of shocked that Japan didn't do better about this. And at the very beginning, they were quite good about it, right? They sort of got that message out right away that we should all mask up. And obviously they didn't have the challenges the political cultural war challenges that were experienced in the United States and the UK. But it's not like everybody walks around wearing a mask 100% of the time in Japan either. So you did have to communicate the importance of that Everywhere you went, there was this message about washing your hands. And, you know, there were, temp you know, some of it was a bit of theater, but it kind of creates a culture where they're taking your temperature anytime you walk into, you know, Uniqlo or a restaurant or anything. So that's sort of communicating the seriousness, seriousness of this. And, and at the beginning in 2020, Japan was one of the countries that was doing quite well on COVID. But then when they started sending these mixed messages, you should go on vacation on go to. No, you should do this. No, we have a state of emergency. No, you have to close at eight. But yes, you can do this. Please do this, but don't do that. I mean, it's very, very confusing and it was not unified. And I understand why the public was fed up. You can't say, oh, we're going to have to go ahead. It's more important than anything ever before to, you know, even with the Paralympics, when they decided not to have spectators for public health reasons, they decided to go ahead and allow school children to come in because it was a good idea for the children to see the Paralympics. It's such mixed messaging. You just can't do that as politicians to send so many mixed messages and expect the public to trust them. So, you know, yes, there were many challenges, but it's really hard to imagine how they could have done it worse. And I really hope that the next administration has learned from, from, from some of this. And I think it is tied into what Kobayashi said I was talking about, you know, different agencies having different agendas and maybe that was confusing and the Conte was trying to coordinate all of that, but that's their job and they have the power to, to, to do better. So, um, you know, I can see why the public has been very, very frustrated with this response. Thank you so much, Motoko, for, for very insightful comments. So, Keichiro, I think, uh, you know, you, I oh. think uh, maybe the, if you can say... I, I have nothing to add, but... Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. I, I, yeah, I, I have a short, short, very short comment. I, Olympic Games. I think that the perfect failure of the communication strategy is, uh, uh, you know, episode of Olympic in Japan. So, so I, uh, before the Olympic, I, I talk about in, in the TV program that uh, uh, we can have an Olympic game with spectators in the stadiums, uh, because I know that there are several uh, simulation results by the uh, Nakata, uh, Professor Nakata at University of Tokyo. They, they show that uh, even though we have Olympic Games with spectators, the, the increase of infection is not so much. And, uh, I, and uh, I also know there are other uh, research, research that show the same results. 
So I, I insisted that we should make, uh, we should have an Olympic game with spectators. But, uh, and the problem is that we, the government should keep, should, uh, keep, keep people, you know, all, all Japanese people with in, inside of the, their home. So stay home. So if the government can, uh, success in their communication strategy, to, to make people uh, uh, stay home, then Olympic game could could have been uh, successful. But uh, the, the problem is that government and experts and all mass media focus on the problem of whether or not we should have the spectators in or in, in the Olympic Olympic Stadium or not. This is a single issue before the just before the Olympic game. But it was a very I think serious mistake. We sh the government should focus on the how to make people uh, stay home. I mean, all Japanese people stay home. That 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 was a, that was a hidden issue, but they cannot. I mean, government cannot uh, uh, you know make a good communication to the to, to the Japanese people. So that was a very, I think, ser um, very serious failure in the Olympic Games. So, okay. Yeah, thank you so much for, for your answer. So that we have uh, so many good questions, but um, you know we are running out of time, so that I cannot cover all the questions. But uh, you know this is really fantastic panel, and uh, you know let, let me think. You know so many new things, and we I feel like I need to think deeper. So that, but um, you know, before closing, so that maybe that why don't why each panel is to say some something which you think the most important so maybe the few words to before closing this session so that maybe the keichiro so the could you start what could be the most important challenge or most important uh, change in japan for foreseeable future could you could you give us a few words well it's a very very uh difficult question but uh I don't know. We are now have a, we will have an election this October, and so so as as many people here say that younger younger voters, if younger voters can can uh, you know participate in the voting this time, that would change the 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 consequence, and uh, maybe we will see a politi uh, very big big change. In a political regime, and then uh, we will uh, have a more better future. But I, I don't know how, how to do, do that. But, but yeah, thank, thank you so much. That's a great point, you know, because the you know some small change may lead to the drastic change in the future. So we should closely monitor that kind of the small change as as Motoko is identifying. So Motoko, could you could you share what you think the most important or? I actually just quickly saw in the question, somebody asked a great question about what role the education system plays in this, yeah. and we haven't talked about okay. that at all. Yeah. That's a subject of a whole other panel. I'm really fascinated by it, but the Japanese ed education system is so consist consistent and coherent in its own terms, but I think it passes on a lot of values and fails to pass on other values. So one of the points that the questioners was making, I think it was Barbara Holtis, uh, about whether or not Japanese children even have a political edge or a civic education that teaches them the importance of voting. I think that's really important. But there's so many other values. I mean, when um, researching the questions about inclusivity and disability policy, um, you know, kids with disabilities go to separate schools. And so that really entrenches this mindset that, you know, people with disabilities are somehow different. If you really want to create an inclusive society, it's not just about throwing the Paralympics once in a lifetime. It is about embedding that in your education system. And I think that's true for so many issues that Japan struggles with, that the education system could be a really fundamental bill Building block for helping um, affect change in Japan. Yeah, thank you so much, Motoko. I thought about uh, picking up the Barbara's question, but uh, we're running out of time. So, the, thank you so much. Uh, you know, addressing the question, that, that question. So, Shiro, could you could you give a few words? Thanks, Ipe. For me, you know, this discussion really highlights the the weaknesses in the structure of decision making and the policy processes in Japan. The health response. Of course, education policy, like like you mentioned, Motoko. But um, coming back to what I mentioned initially, one thing you know I, I think that does fly under the radar a bit, but it's, it's the policies and the orientation of Japan trying to navigate this 
constrained external environment between the United States and, and China, and, and whether we can do that without adversely affecting Japanese prosperity. So that's what I'm, I'll be watching, in addition to all the other um, challenges of, of governance. Okay, thank you very much. So that we can continue this panel next two hours or three hours, but uh, you know, time is running up. So that we would like to close this session. And again, uh, please join me thanking uh, three fantastic uh, the panelists for for great insight for discussion. Thank you very much. And thanks for your moderation, thank you. Ibe. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ibe, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so now that we should move on to the closing remarks, Shiro. So are you ready? I am ready. It'll be very quick. Okay. Um, well, thank you uh, for, for that last panel and, and thank you everybody for, for staying on online. I'm not going to attempt to summarize um, the whole day. We had a, a lot, but just very quickly um, to remind you of what we've, what we've heard. An overview, of course, from Sawada-san at the, the beginning in the morning of Japan and Asia and where we're at. And we're a long way away from out of this crisis um, yet, and, and we really heard some challenging things about uh, the response in Japan and the effect on society in Japan in the first session. Um, the suicides uh, going up and the inequality there, of, of, um, where there are really big gaps in the social safety net. And you know, I think we touched on this idea in the last session of social capital and how important that is in Japan. Well, th there are limits to that. And I think we're seeing some of the limits to that during this pandemic. Um, and of course, Japan being open to immigration and, and quite um, surprising, I think, to some of you, just how much support there is um, from the Japanese government. Mm -hmm. Looks like a very different story from the Australian government, which um, we had a nice presentation on that in the morning. And then, of course, the second session on Japan as a global tech leader. Um, I think this, there's still a long way to go. So uh, made huge progress in digitalization um, from home. Of course, the energy transition is already underway, but all that points to drastic change that's coming still or needs to come. So this is where, of course, the governance challenges and the sort of communication, but also structure of decision making needs to improve in Japan so that the energy transition can be undertaken and to reach that net zero by 2050 target, um, but also to really bring Japan out of the era of faxes, um, uh, the age of faxes. And already I think we're getting rid of the hunkle, but um, more importantly, building in flexibility to work hours and work practices so that we can get participation rates up um, and be able to judge people more on output, not just input sitting in offices for a long time. So in that final session, we heard a lot about the governance challenges um, and the coordination problems, which uh, is the clearest explanation I've heard of, of why the response in Japan to the COVID crisis has been how it's been. Um, and I think the, the lackluster response there on borders and, and the shutdowns and the, then the encouraging people to travel to all corners of the country. I mean, I think this is where, even though Japan succeeded in holding an Olympics and a Paralympics in such a difficult time, um, I think the Japanese population could have um, asked for much more and should have deserved much more. So as Motoko said, we can all learn from Japan um, it's pretty important to recognize these gaps in governance. And it's a pretty big opportunity for the new leadership in Japan. So um, we had a pretty full day. Um, thank you all for, for sticking with us uh, and joining us online, despite all the Zoom fatigue everybody has. I want to especially thank Alexi Hiesel, who's been behind the scenes organizing everything. Um, put a lot of work into running this as a hybrid event. So with a live audience in Canberra and an online audience, but of course we have to transition uh, to an online only event. So thanks Alexi for all the hard work that hasn't been wasted, um, but also the help you've had to from Shion Takiguchi and Sakura Kapilaki um, and the, the rest of the team. Um, thank you to the speakers, to Motoko and Keichiro who are still with us, but also the speakers who joined us earlier on today and even from Washington very late at night, um, uh, the update of course, wouldn't happen without your insights. And it's such a privilege to be able to get you together, um, you know, for one day a year to hear the latest on Japan and, and to tease out some of these ideas. Hopefully we can do it in person next year uh, and get some of you down to, to Canberra, but also broadcast this live online as well. 
Uh, finally, um, almost finally, thanks to the audience. Um, I realize it's not easy just transitioning to online. We tried to make it a little bit shorter than an all day event. Um, but please, we'll send a, a survey out through an email and please give us your feedback. We'll try to improve this, of course, like we do each year. I think in our ninth year, um, just for this series, we're getting a bit better at running things and the balance of the panels. So I look forward to your feedback. Uh, and finally, to thank Lauren and Ite, my conspirators in this Japan update, um, for you know what was, I think, a very successful update from my perspective. And, and hopefully we get another big one next year with people in person um, and online as well. So thanks to Lauren, Ipe, the rest of the team, and thank you all for joining us yet again. I'll close this year's Japan update. Thank you.